All right. Good evening, Fiveable. All right. So we are here with our first broadcast of the second semester of the spring semester. The exam will be here in about four months. So let's go ahead and start getting prepared. Y'all, excuse me. Uh, my voice is going to be off. I've had a cold and I've been coughing. Uh, good news is, since you're online, it's not contagious. There's no, you know, you don't have to be afraid. Like, is he going to get me sick or something like that? Not going to happen because we've got this little like internet barrier here. So it looks like there are nine of you here. I've got one question that's been asked so far, which I'll go ahead and tend to. Uh, and then if I don't see any more questions, I will talk about some things of my choice and we'll, uh, you know, have a good session. So um, let me go ahead and tackle this here. Now, Kim, you're asking, what is the best way easiest to apply to the variety of possible topics to earn the complexity point in the DBQ essay? Now, the thing is that from what I'm seeing, okay, and, and this is just now I've got a, you know, video series on YouTube about the AP Euro DBQ. I've also got my eight month writing clinic uh, that the thing is, this is a moving target, all right, that from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing from readers as well, uh, typically that's going to be the seventh point. Uh, if you write an outstanding essay, then you could get that point. Now, what I'm also hearing is if people thought you were going to be able to do like one thing and get that point, that's not necessarily a given. OK, so it's it's not necessarily, at least not on the DBQ, that you can just like, OK, I'm going to do this and then that's going to be OK. Now, here are some things. Now, that point is for complex understanding. Let me pull up. Let me pull up the rubric and just go over some ways that we might do this. But remember, this is really, uh, you know, in functionality, it seems to be a capstone point. OK, so let me go ahead and kind of explain to you um, what I mean here. OK, so as far as that uh, as that goes, let's see what we've got. All right, a push DBQ rubric. So let's go ahead and put that uh, put that on the screen. I'm going to share my screen with you in just a bit. And every other point, there is much more of a cut and dry element that you do this and you're going to get this point. OK, now. As far as this goes. For the complex understanding point now. Is the focus the prompt using evidence to corroborate, qualify, or modify an argument? Now, one thing um, in any of the, you know, and in my eight month writing clinic, I've been working on some sample essays that I'm going to make available um, for that. But one of the best things that you can do, okay, because you're using evidence to corroborate, qualify, or modify an argument that addresses the question. Um, that some sort of grouping, okay? In my video on the DBQ, I talk about writing, creating a T-chart, okay? That essentially you're not going through the documents, document one says, document two says, document three says, uh, but you are coming up with a good two or three arguments. I really like three. If you're thinking complex understanding, uh, think about a stool, okay? Now, ideally, I think a stool would have like four um, what do you call these things like a chair? You have four legs, right? I'm um, sorry. I've been, I've been a little under the weather. I've been on some medication. So just uh, bear with me, but yes, a stool ideally would have four legs, but you could sit on a stool with three legs. There are stools with three legs that do just fine. Now a stool with two legs, unless you are some sort of, you know, circus employee or something like that, that's going to be a little bit tough. Uh, if you're into gymnastics or you're using the force or something like that. <laughs> but typically, you know, dividing the documents into three groups and putting the documents into conversation with each other. Now, the thing is, the way that I look at it, the best way to do this, to get this point, and it's, it's not so much do this and that happens, but here's the thing. When this happens, you get the point. The reader looks at what you wrote and says, Wow. OK, when you look at the seven out of seven released essays, it's usually one of those essays where a student is writing an essay that their teacher reads it and thinks, wow, this looks like a teacher wrote it. OK, I mean, that's really what you're going for. So first of all, explaining nuance. OK, so when you saw something in the document that other people didn't see, OK, that's like, oh, there was like this this little like kind of 
tidbit in there that a lot of other people aren't catching. A lot of people are looking over and you're showing that you know that. Now, also incorporating thinking skills and stuff like that. So if you're writing a DDQ, if you if you incorporate continuity and change over time, okay? Like now some prompts are continuity and change over time prompts. But in this case, like if you can incorporate something into your argument to where it's not just static, but maybe one of your arguments is about, hey, I mean, there's continuity and change here. Like one of these sample essays I'm working on, this is actually for AP Euro, but it's still relevant because we're talking about writing here, correct? Correct, okay. So as far as that goes, um, what I've got here is, this is about whether the industrialization of Manchester was a positive or negative thing for Britain. Now, what I've got here is I've got some negative things. Okay. These are, uh, you know, bad working conditions, bad for the environment, yada, yada. We've got some positive things. Okay. So talking about the positive parts of growth. And then this paragraph is going to focus on the improvement of conditions in Manchester. Now, let me just, you know, like I said, even though this is AP Euro, it's still as far as the format, I think that that's going to, uh, that's going to help. But in the previous paragraphs, what I did is I went into here are the, the pluses, here are the minuses. And then this is my third body paragraph. If things had not improved, it might be difficult to decide whether industrialization was good for Britain or not. But things improved a great deal thanks to technology and the responsiveness of parliament. Now, that's my topic sentence. Okay. If we're, if we're going for complex understanding, our essay needs to be really organized. So that's the argument. William Abram, a journalist and historian, noted that conditions had improved because of the passage of the 10 hour act and other laws aimed at reforming the factory system to make things cleaner and reduce working hours. Doc six. As a journalist, Abram would probably get more readers if he criticized conditions and wrote about how bad things were. So what he says is reliable because it wouldn't gain him as many readers. Now, this is something that's kind of a, you know, that's a complex way of looking at this in the sense that, oh, OK, not everybody would have caught that, that since he's a journalist, um, he's saying things are good. That probably wouldn't be, you know, so you're seeing things that other people aren't seeing. The preface to a business directory called Manchester remarks and attractive, although this can be dismissed as pro-industry propaganda for business leaders. Now, I've got a little point of view incorporated into that. Now, that's another thing. I think that part of complex understanding, don't stop at what I call POV plus, what your teacher may call HIP, uh, you know, CAP, you know, whatever they're calling. I think POV plus just works for me, okay? So, I would say do that for like four or five documents, like really go into that document analysis. And then, you know, outside evidence. Another way you could do this is to incorporate like just a slew of outside evidence, you know, nothing like too ridiculous to where you're, you know, eating into time for your LEQ. But I would consider, uh, I would consider that. Okay. So I'd, I'd consider using more than one piece of evidence, all right? So as far as that goes, I think that when you're looking at complex understanding, there are seven points on the rubric, six of which are earned with very specific things. Was contextualization there or not? Was the thesis there or not? Uh, you know, did they accurately describe three? Did they support an argument with six? Did the student uh, explain three documents based on point of view and all those other things? Uh, was there at least one additional piece of specific historical evidence? And so to me, um, and, and what I've what I've seen is is not that it's like, oh, there's this little bit thing here that got this student complex understanding. <coughs> that it is, you know, it's just, there's so much extra stuff here. I've got to give this person the point. Okay. And so when it comes down to it as well, qualifying or modifying an argument by considering diverse or alternative views. And so when you look at the thesis statement uh, that I've got here, your thesis statement sets up for complexity. Again, this is AP Euro, but still same, same uh, kind of, uh, same kind of essay. All right. 
Although the living and working conditions in Manchester were atrocious, the industrialization of Manchester was an overall positive development for Britain because of the massive economic growth it created. Furthermore, evidence indicates that conditions improved substantially later in the 19th century. Today, Manchester is best known for its football team. All right, in quotes, because of course that's uh, European football that we call soccer. So the thing is that when you look at that essay, it's really taken as a whole. This is excellent work, and it looks like the kind of essay that a teacher uh, might have uh, might have done. Okay. Oh yeah, Judy. Okay. Hopefully you're still here, and you can uh, you can see me saying hello. Okay. Yeah, I got to got to meet Judy over the summer at the A Push reading. Uh, yes, very, very, uh, very glad. Let's see, T Design that you were saying. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that if you set it up with the T chart, that everything, the T chart, it guarantees that everything is organized and that three distinct arguments are being made. Now, you can make two arguments and that's fine, but I think when you're making three distinct arguments, you're you're telling the reader basically, look, this is excellent work and I deserve this extra point. Okay. And think about that. I mean, Clemson just won the national championship. Uh, you know, bam, you know, when you score a touchdown. I mean, if you think about it, you know what? I like this. She said something about Clemson. And now I'm thinking that. So when you score a touchdown, then you get to kick the extra point. Now, keep in mind, you could score the extra point here without getting six points. But I would say nine times out of 10, you're looking at complex understanding being the seventh point, okay? Because it's really just kind of like this thing was just so excellent that we cannot help, uh, you know, but do that. All right, so hopefully that was helpful to you, to you, Kim. And yeah, just remember that it's not based on just one thing, that it's just the overall quality of the essay is just so good that an extra point is, uh, you know, is warranted. Um, in the 1920s, okay, now uh, Zoe, y'all are just like, okay, I mean, y'all are like Usain Bolt, like just y'all are flying through this stuff. Um, Yeah, Zoe, I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, just to be completely forthright with you, I mean, there was consumerism, but then you're mixing in socialism. I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Now, I'll invite you on screen. I have yet to see anybody ever join me on screen on one of these things, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and issue the invite just in case, because I'm not sure that I understand your question. Um, because, you know, sure, there were socialists in the 1920s, but the United States has never uh, been in a situation where, you know, a significant part of the population uh, was, you know, identified as socialist. So while there were people like, you know, Eugene V. Debs uh, ran for president in 1920, he only got a few votes. Uh, so the consumerist culture yeah, I don't see that. Okay. So as far as that goes, what was society like in the West? Okay. Now, Carla, your uh, your question is rather vague, but what I'm going to do here <coughs> is I'm going to go ahead and just start a presentation for a bit. Okay. And I'm going to try to hit some points. This is actually something that I haven't yet put on my channel. At some point, I might. Okay. Because it's kind of a long lecture and I'm not sure how I divide it up for YouTube, but I just got a new camera. And I'm going to get uh, into that. All right. But before I do, Mike's got a question. OK, the populist, how significant? OK, now, one thing that I do when I'm thinking, you know, a question like how significant you go to the outline or the, the AP U.S. history course description. OK, where did I put that? OK, so let's figure out how significant populist. OK. <laughs> All right. We do have a mention. That's a good thing. OK, when we're thinking about something that's important, like something that we want to stress before the exam, we'd like to see at least one mention of that word in the course description when we're thinking about prioritizing what to study. Um, so I see one there and then I see one. Let's see. Now, this is 7.1. This is. Now, remember that populism is really any movement that. any movement that is aimed at everyday people, 
who feel alienated by their government, who feel that their government has been taken over by elites. So when everyday people feel like their government's been taken over by elites, they start populist movements. Now, most recently, you see where Bernie Sanders and Donald they both had, yeah, I mean, these were distinct populism, but these were both campaigns in 2016 that the campaign toward people who felt that they were alienated by their government and that they their government was controlled by elites that basically in the general election, Donald Trump used a lot of the same rhetoric against Hillary Clinton that Bernie Sanders had in the primary. So remember, small P populism, um, something that's appealing to common people who feel alienated by their government. Okay. So as far as that goes, we do have a specific mention in the course description. Economic instability inspired agrarian activists to create the People's Party, the Populist Party, which called for a stronger government role in regulating the American economic system. Now, one thing here that we can see is that when we think about the populist, for example, um, one thing that we're one thing that we could note here is that it's focusing on the economic reforms that were that were set that were advocated by the populists. So the thing is, when we look at the populist platform. OK, so first of all, there were political reform proposals. And um, so you've got. First of all, direct election of senators. Now, that's something that we're going to see uh, in the progressive era, the 17th Amendment. Now, none of the populist ideas were acted on at the time, but a lot of them are actually part of our you know, system today. Today, we directly elect our senators. They're no longer elected like they were in the, you know, the original U.S. Constitution. Ballot initiatives, okay? Ballot initiatives, meaning that these are things, if you live in California, they call these propositions. Uh, this is where people, you know, ordinary citizens can circulate petitions. And if they get a certain amount of signatures, then they can get an initiative on the ballot. And so it's like, you know, marijuana is not recreational marijuana is not legal in the state of California because the California legislature passed a law. So this was not a product of the political class. That was actually a populist measure. OK, because small P populism, because this is something that started with the people and they put it on the ballot and they made it into a law without consulting the legislature. Now, some states have ballot initiatives, some states don't. Secret ballot. OK, now this is something that wasn't common in the 19th century. Uh, this whole idea that somebody's vote should be a secret. My state of South Carolina didn't adopt the secret ballot till sometime in the mid 20th century, I believe. I, I forget the year, but I do know that South Carolina was the last state to adopt the secret ballot. Now, those are the political reform proposals. Now, what I'm seeing in the course description is that the focus seems to be on the economic reform proposals. So first of all, a graduated or progressive income tax. Now, a progressive income tax is a tax that, uh, you know, as people make more income, they're paying a higher percentage of that income to the government. So they wanted a, a system of taxation that made people with more money, the more money you make, then the more you're financing the government. Whereas uh, in the late 19th century, what was happening, uh, the government was largely funded by the tariff, okay, tariff revenues from things coming into the country. And so, of course, there wasn't a whole lot of trade there, but when something did come in, they slapped a big old tariff on it. So they wanted to change the tax taxation system. And of course, that's the 16th Amendment that is passed during the progressive era. Unlimited coinage of silver. OK, so now they wanted the bimetallism. Now, so the thing that they're against is the gold standard, uh, which is, you know, the gold standard has its advantages because you can count on your money being worth something. If your money's backed by gold, you can know that hey, this is not going to be worthless in a few years. They can't just print more paper and make more money, okay? And so as far as that, uh, as that goes, uh, the unlimited coinage of silver. Now, 
the downside of the gold standard, especially if you're not somebody that has a lot of money. Now, the gold standard is especially good for people who have a lot of savings. OK, now the populist party, these are not people who have a lot of savings. And so, you know, if you don't have a lot of savings, then inflation is really not as big of a deal as for somebody that has a lot of accumulated wealth. And so the problem for the farmers, they felt like, you know, I mean, yeah, the money's worth something, but there's not enough money in circulation. So they were having they were having trouble. And so they wanted to create more currency. They wanted to inflate the currency. Now, remember, inflation in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. OK, that as long as inflation is keeping pace with economic growth, then that's fine. So, you know, we have inflation right now, I think around two or three percent, as long as it's keeping pace, because you what you don't want is for the economy to grow and the money supply does not grow because then there's not enough money in circulation. And so they wanted to solve this problem by unlimited coinage of silver. Now, thing is, on one hand, uh, if you have this unlimited coinage of silver, the 16 to 1, then that's going to devalue the currency and create economic instability. So that's one of their other their other plans. Now, the other thing is, and this kind of goes into what you saw in the course description, that they wanted the federal government to take over the railroads. All right. So they wanted nationalization of the railroads, that basically that the government is going to buy out all of the railroads and they're going to operate them on behalf of the people. Uh, now, one thing that I always mention is how Jeffersonian is this? Okay, so when we think about the, the populist, uh, these plans, now the thing is, on one hand, these are farmers. Jefferson liked farmers. Um, farmers had been really the backbone of the United States uh, before the Civil War. And so when America's industrializing, uh, Jefferson, you know, this, this country of Jefferson isn't really existing anymore. It does, but not in the same way. So farmers, after the Civil War, you get to around 1890 and farmers only make up about 40 percent of Americans. And so, you know, which before that, I mean, it was just it was the vast majority of Americans were farmers. And so but especially with mechanized farming, which is making farming more efficient, you don't need as many. Like today, I think we've got like one out of 50 Americans, I think, is a farmer uh, somewhere around there. So one person farming with all the technology we have can feed 50 people. <coughs> But the thing is, although these are farmers, remember, Jefferson was not a fan of big government. He was not a fan of government intervention in the economy. And that's exactly what the populists are looking for. So the populists, you do want to understand that the populists were looking for an expansion of the role of government uh, because they believed that that was going to be the that was going to be the answer to the problem that they had of government being in the pocket of big business. All right. So we're done answering, uh, answering that one. And so very quickly. OK, now, Zoe, uh, y'all are ahead of everybody, but, you know, you are here and you've been here all the time. Like, I mean, I recognize you. So let me just go ahead and address that uh, for just briefly. Now, um, the Red Scare. OK, so now they're they're actually two red scares. Now here's here's the thing that you want to uh, that you want to note about the red the red scares. Now they both come after wars. Okay? So the first red scare is after World War 1 and the second red scare is after World War 2. Let me actually see if I can get uh, you know get something up here. I'm going to get a little proper uh, fiveable graphic together here and Okay, my computer is working. My computer is working. Okay, this may be a non-starter here because it's, um, you know, it's just seeming to take a little while. Sometimes I've got, you know, if I'm broadcasting and all of that kind of stuff. Let's see what we've got, uh, what we've got here.
Okay. You know what? I'm just going to explain. I'm just going to explain it without any any visuals. Okay. But uh, I'll come up with a visual at some other point. So the first Red Scare happens after World War I. Second Red Scare after World War II. Now, World War I, uh, what's going on here is by the time World War I comes around, between 1890 and 1920, you have the so-called new immigrants. Okay. These are people coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. So Southern and Eastern Europe, you know, like Italy, um, Greece, Poland, Russia, and these people are coming from places that are not, uh, you know, so they're they're coming from places that historically, uh, you know, they don't have, they don't speak English, they don't have Republican institutions, and also when you, you know, when you consider Russia, 1917, the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution happens, and so there's a very real fear that, you know, all of these immigrants who've come from these, uh, these strange countries in Europe, that they have been radicalized. Now, I will say here that this is not without merit. You know, there were certainly radical, uh, you know, radical immigrants coming in, you know, people who had been radicalized. I'm actually reading a book right now um, that is about Cold War spies. And as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, these, uh, these Cold War spies, uh, there was one that the, the the Soviet government had hired because he had lived in the United States. OK, so his his father had brought the family to uh, the United States from Finland. And then when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, his father brought them back to the Soviet Union. Uh, because his father was a socialist and there were a lot of socialists who came over um, because they were being kicked out of their countries in Europe. And, you know, so then this guy was, of course, you know, of course, uh, co-opted by the Soviet government uh, in order to be a spy because he'd grown up in the United States and he had fully unaccented English. Now, the mistake the guy made was he um, they got him to write home and or not write write to some family in the United States. States and ask, can you get me a copy of my birth certificate? And of course, this was during the second Red Scare in the 1950s. And his family member instantly went uh, went and talked to the FBI and said, I've gotten this request uh, and I need you to be aware of it because he might be plotting something. So when you think about it, like the these Red Scares, um, even of course, it was it was correct. So when the guy came in and tried to be an agent of the Soviets, he was the FBI found him almost immediately and turned him. It's it's a really interesting story. But I digress. I mean, the thing is that the what do you call it? Um, yeah, that basically there were people coming in that were radicalized. And so the question is, what do you do there? OK, because, you know, I always talk about it with my with my kid. Uh, you know, if my daughter is I'm, I, I love my daughter, she's wonderful. But if she's being a pain in the neck, uh, then there's really nothing I can do. I can't say like, you know, Caroline, go sleep outside or Caroline, I'm sending you to live with somebody else. She's my daughter. Now, the thing is, if one of Caroline's friends is annoying me, I can say, hey, playtime's over. Y'all going to have to go outside or y'all, you go back to your house, but you're not going to stay here because this is my house and you're not my child. And so the question is, what are you going to do with these, uh, you know, with these radical um, immigrants and how much? And of course, that kind of goes into like what we've got uh, today. Some of the discussions we have about uh, immigrant rights, you know, someone who lives here but is not necessarily a citizen. So the Palmer rates. OK, you want to think about the first Red Scare, the Palmer rates. This is, uh, you know, this is basically uh, they go in and they're like, look, I mean, if these people are radical, uh, it doesn't matter if they're actually doing anything like, you know, there are several people that are deported um, back to uh, you know, back to Europe because they're just, you know, we don't want them in the United States. But at the same time, there were a lot of people who were also harassed, like needlessly and monitored and stuff like that, um, because people, you know, people were afraid of communism, which, you know, I'm afraid of communism. It just, uh, you know, it happens uh, to the best of us. And then, of course, the second red scare is when you get into McCarthyism. Okay. So that's where you've got Joe McCarthy and he's accusing people of be, you know, that they're communists embedded in our government, which there were, he just didn't have as much information as he claimed to have. Okay. So when it came down to it, he was just throwing this around and it's almost like <clears throat> if you make 10 jokes, like a couple of them are probably going to be funny. All right. So when it comes down to it, 
you know, that's the second Red Scare, which is coming after World War II, and that's what's bringing about the Cold War. So when you think about the first Red Scare, the Palmer Raids, and especially the concern about radical immigrants and what the United States is to do with them, and how much do they share in the rights of Americans? Like, you know, what what are the rights of an American citizen? And then what are the rights of a person that lives here? And, you know, those are, you know, the courts have decided that in most cases, people that live here have a lot of those same rights. Now, of course, you know, if somebody is suspected of being dangerous to the United States, they could be deported. So that's what you see happening in the first Red Scare. And so as far as that, now remember also the 1920s are also a time when uh, you've got kind of a reaction to progressivism. There are immigration laws that are passed at that time. So immigration quota acts that are passed in the 1920s to try to reduce immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe in these areas where they think that, uh, you know, they're going to have the most uh, radical um, immigrants coming from. All right. So what was society like in the West during this time period? OK, so Carla, I'm going to just, uh, you know, this is what I was going to talk about today. So let's go ahead and get into it. And this is a lecture that I've, you know, that I've given live. I've designed. I've got all the slides and all that. I've never put it on my channel. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of cherry pick because this would take a long time for me to get through, I think probably more than 30 minutes, but the conquest of the American West. So the thing is, we want to note here that in 1848, the Mexican session extended America's borders to the Pacific, to the Pacific Ocean. So that is manifest destiny, mission accomplished. Okay. So we've got that done, but not quite, because the thing is that manifest destiny. It's kind of like if you think about the French colonies, okay, so New France, that territory is of no use if no one lives there, all right? So if no one lives there, then what's the use of having all that territory? Like there were very few French people there, and, you know, if you can't improve the land, if you can't put people on it, then it's worthless. And so the process of conquering the West, okay, so the federal government had a three-pronged process of conquering the West, free land, railroads, and, excuse me, and military force. So first of all, free land. Now, Frederick Jackson Turner wrote um, the significance of the frontier in American history. Okay. So he was, he, he was actually a presenter at the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And what Turner, a historian was writing about is that the, um, what do you call it? Sorry. Um, uh, Okay, so Turner is writing this after 1890, which was the first census where they declared that there is no frontier line. Every census between 1790 and 1880 had a line drawn. This is where the frontier is, and that line continually went west, all right? And so as far as that goes... Frederick Jackson Turner saying here, the most significant thing about the American frontier is that it lies at the hither edge of free land. But what's going to happen to the United States now that the frontier is no longer there? That was the question that he was pondering, that the frontier's always been a part of our history, which it's pretty impressive that you go from 1860 to not even having a railroad to 1890. It's declared there's no more frontier. And so as far as that goes, one little tidbit that's kind of interesting is when you go west of Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, you look at all these states in the west, the federal government owns a lot of land. I mean, the federal government owns, still owns 85% of Nevada, um, owns almost half of California, owns uh, half of Oregon. So there's a lot of federal land. Now, a lot of land, there was also a lot of federal land here, but they gave it away. Okay. But now you see in the east, the federal government owns very little of the land in these states, especially when you look at the 13 original states. And so lots of land, LOL, okay? The federal government has lots of land to give away. And they do this with, uh, you know, with three acts that are passed by Congress, um, the Homestead Act, the Morrill Land Grant Act, and the Dawes Act. So homesteads, all right? So 
the Homestead Act was passed in 1862. This was really the other side of free soil. When we think about free soil, we think, okay, these are the people who didn't want slavery to spread. Now, what did they want to spread? They wanted white farmers to be able to go out and uh, make these uh, make homesteads. So the Homestead Act said that if you will move west, then you can get 160 acres given to you. And once you can show that you've actually put a working farm on that, the federal government will sign it over to you. And so that's the other part of free soil. It's literally free soil. It's not just free, like free from slavery, but it's free land that's being given away by the federal government. So we see that the free soil aspirations of the Republicans are realized in the Homestead Act. So 600,000 families go to Kansas and, <coughs> excuse me, Kansas and Nebraska at that time, including the Exodusters. Now the Exodusters, this was a group of African-American families that left the South after the failure of radical reconstruction and established homesteads in Kansas and other Western states. Now, what we want to note here is even though the Exodusters, there were black families that left the South and went to Kansas, uh, this wasn't a large group, okay? You want to make sure now, of course, uh, some of you who are in the 1920s already, <coughs> You might be already learning about the Great Migration. Most African Americans stayed in the South during this time until World War One. World War One is the time where you start to see this Great Migration of African Americans. Now, the Morrill Land Grant Act, which is uh, which includes Clemson University, Go Tigers. We just uh, won the National College Football, the College Football National Championship. So in 1862, the Morrill Land Grant Act, which was designed in order to encourage um, states to use the sale of federal lands to create um, agricultural and mechanical colleges. So when you see uh, Clemson, for example, used to be Clemson Agricultural and Mechanical College. LSU was, you know, as an A&M school. Texas A&M still has the A&M thing, okay? Agriculture, mechanical. So agriculture, mechanical arts, and they added military tactics, okay? Because remember early on in the Civil War, um, the Union's having a hard time finding uh, finding good generals because a lot of the, you know, most, uh, most experienced and competent generals went to the South. All right. So as far as that uh, goes, military tactics, that was a great uh, brawl some years back. All right. And so you've got land grant colleges and universities. Now, the other thing is, um, and this is kind of a common theme through this time, how can uh, the United States government take Indian land and open it up for white settlement. And so what you see there is the Dawes Act. So in 1887, reservations were broken up and tribal lands were distributed to individual Indian families. Surplus lands in Indian territory were opened up to white settlement. Now, so that's include that's where you get Oklahoma because before the Daw before the Dawes Act in 1887. Now, as far as those of you who are in the 1920s, make sure you differentiate this from the Dawes Plan, which is of course having to do with uh, making loans to Germany in the 1920s to help them pay their war reparations. So the Oklahoma land rush in uh, April, you know, in 1889, um, that is where Oklahoma, you know, they call themselves the Sooner State. Uh, some people People didn't wait till April 22nd. They went in sooner. And so now the goal here of Indian policy um, in the United States, like why are they going to take the tribal lands and divide them into um, or divide them into smaller groups and stuff like that? OK, why are they going to do that? Well, the reason that they're going to uh, the reason they're going to do that is they want Indians to assimilate. OK, because really, when it comes down to it, uh, the lifestyle that Native Americans had enjoyed for, you know, hundreds of years, uh, these lifestyles. Now, of course, the Plains Indians who hunted who hunted bison. Uh, they used, you know, they hunted bison on horseback. That was part of the Columbian Exchange. But the Transcontinental Railroad's coming in. White settlers are coming in. It's going to be very difficult to keep that way of life up. So the goal here is to assimilate <coughs> these Indian populations into mainstream American culture. 
And so as far as that goes, uh, one of these projects was the Carlisle Indian School. There are several Indian schools that were opened up here. And what they would do is they would take um, these young, you know, these boys, and they would put them in, you know, dormitories, and their roommate would be somebody from another tribe, which would force these boys to speak English. Now, looking back, I know the Canadian government's been especially apologetic. I'm not sure how much the U.S. government had to do with the schools, but I know the Canadian government was very active at that time, trying to assimilate the native population, and is very apologetic about that today. But you know, I think that the intentions, at least, were good, even if looking back, you think, okay, really, was that necessarily, you know, try to basically, you know, get these people to forget on um, their cultural heritage. Now, so then you've got the transcontinental railroads, okay? So the transcontinental railroads, um, where we see why did the U.S. government subsidize the construction of the transcontinental railroads? What were the advantages and disadvantages of government action? So, in 1860, at the start of the Civil War, like your problem here is that you've got people who settled in Oregon and California, but you don't have a connection between the two of them. Like, you know, in 1860, the way that you would uh, you would get there would still would still be um, a wagon train. And that's not very efficient, okay, especially at a time we go in the 1860s where we've got the Bessemer process, okay? This has opened up um, the, the mass production of steel. And so we can create a lot more railroads. So how do we create a national market? How do we connect California and Oregon to the rest of the country? Now, you know, I always like to bring up Jefferson and Hamilton. Remember that Jefferson, you know, he would say, how do you create a marketplace? Laissez-faire, you let the market develop on its own. Whereas Hamilton believed in government action, you know, that basically uh, the economic growth to Hamilton is going to, uh, is going to happen better if the government is supporting economic growth. And so the biggest one of the biggest things about the Civil War and the economic consequences is that you see that it go the federal government goes away from this Jeffersonian mindset more toward the Hamiltonian mindset of government action as something that spurs on the economy. So when the Jeffersonians, you know, who dominated Southern politics, when they left and joined the Confederacy, then, you know, what we see here is that Congress had an overwhelming Republican majority that was uh, supportive of the American system. So secession created a large Republican majority in Congress that was friendly to government intervention in the economy. And so, you know, Lincoln not only was, you know, Lincoln's party was not only a free soil party, but also the party that supported industry and big business, not so much the party of agriculture. So the Pacific Railroad Act, now notice, that these acts are being passed during the Civil War, okay? So this is something that, uh, you know, we think about this, uh, you know, and what the, you know, the, the issues that were at stake at the Civil War, one of them is this, uh, you know, this Republican mindset that the government should cooperate with corporations. Now, remember, Jackson was very much against uh, a relationship between government and corporations, a direct relationship. So government subsidies for corporations would be given to construct railroads. Now, a subsidy is a financial incentive from authorities that is intended to encourage desired outcomes. For example, a lot of you might have been in a boat, at least at some point, you might have a situation now where if you make straight A's, your parents will give you some money or they'll do something nice for you. Maybe they'll let you stay out past your curfew. They want you to make A's, they'll reward you for that behavior. And so as far as that goes, the Pacific Railroad Act. Now, one thing to note here, is that it marked the first time that the federal government was giving money directly to corporations for internal improvements and not uh, distributing money to the states for internal improvements, which of course had been very, very limited before the Civil War. And so as far as that, again, lots of land. How can the federal government encourage these railroad companies to lay track? Well, they do that with land. And so the federal land grants, what happened was uh, they would lay this track in a checkerboard pattern. 
and or I mean that would lay the track and then in a checkerboard pattern um for every mile of track then the railroad would get three square miles of land uh, that it could then sell. The federal government would keep three square miles. So for every mile of track, you get three square miles of land. Now, the federal government subsidized several transcontinental railroads with these land grants. And so, you know, you had a couple of railroads going back and forth. Uh, you know, basically, they're, try they're going to meet in the middle in Utah. So the Union Pacific Railroad uh, is starting in Nebraska and the Central Pacific Railroad starting in California. Now, you've got uh, a lot of like Irish uh, laborers here in the Union Pacific, a lot of them Union War veterans. So that's easy to remember there, Union Pacific. And then Central Pacific, you've got a lot of Chinese workers. Now, Central Pacific, California. Chinese. Okay. So you see that they're building and they're going to meet each other in Utah. Now, more miles, more money. So when you look at this, here is the transcontinent, the Union Pacific Railroad in Nebraska. And you can see their land grant here. Now, when you take a look at that, uh, look at this. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But then you see here where it's just this railroad is snaking around. It's like, OK, what can we do here to get, uh, you know, to get uh, as much track laid as possible? So at times this railroad wasn't necessarily the most efficient uh, idea, but it did get the job done. And that's what you, you know, when you've got government intervention in the economy, uh, you know, it can get the job done. Now, maybe not quite as well as if somebody had done it with their own money, but still. <clears throat> but lots of land. Now, this is, of course, some Democratic uh, election propaganda um, that's noting that, like, look, this is how much money, like, basically the people's land um, is going, you know, this is $278 million. Now, that's $278 million by that time, uh, by that valuation of currency. A lot more today <laughs> that the Democratic Party <clears throat> did not uh you know did not you know was campaigning against the republicans who are uh you know basically giving away all of this land to the corporations that belongs to the people now there were some uh some corruption involved here the credit mobilier scandal um, a union pacific executive decided well you know what i've got this money from the federal government I'm going to also create a construction company. So I'm going to create the, you know, so I've got the railroad. I'm going to pay the construction company, which is my company. And I'm kind of laundering money through this. And this is what happens in some cases, especially at this time. Now, the government's gotten a lot better at, uh, you know, catching people in fraud and stuff like that. But people still defraud the government. Um, but at this time, it was rampant. All right. And so government subsidies would go to the Union Pacific Railroad than to credit mobilier. And the thing is, you know, this guy's using the people's money to pay himself. Now, where's Congress? Congress is in the pocket of people who are connected to these railroad interests. Um, you know, basically, this guy who you don't have to know his name, um, but he's going around and giving out shares of credit mobilier. So Congress is, you know, people in Congress actually own shares of this company and they're not going to be as quick to, uh, they're not going to be as quick to go through, uh, you know, to, to try to investigate what's going on here. And that really, during this time, you can see this public perception of uh, of Congress. Okay. So you see the Senate here, the bosses of the Senate, that all of the trust, all of the trust, uh, you know, are there, they're dominating the big business interests, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, the senators, you know, the people's entrance up there is closed. Okay. So you've got, uh, you've got that. Now, eventually the credit mobilier scandal becomes, you know, that it's, it's, under the radar for a little while, but it's found out. And what we see here is, uh, you know, a cartoon that is, uh, you know, kind of poking fun at uh, Asian uh, suicide rituals. Uh, Harry Carey, where basically there he's going to commit ceremonial suicide. Now, remember, this is a time uh, once the transcontinental railroads were finished, then people didn't have as much use for Chinese cheap labor, excuse me, and immigration. And so with that, 
um, you know, what you uh, what you see there is the Chinese Exclusion Act passes around this uh, passes around this time. Now, so should the government subsidize corporations? It's a great question to think about. Uh, you know, this is kind of the beginning of, you know, what pe some people call crony capitalism, where the uh, you know, where basically the government gives this co company money and they're giving money to people because of their friends and people are getting rich at the expense of the people, uh, including Leland Stanford. Now, this is something that you see a lot of, like California was dominated by the Central Pacific Railroad. So Leland Stanford, the president of the Central Pacific Railroad, also was elected governor of California. So you've got this uh, this alliance between, you know, politics and business. Now you can kind of see where the populist party is coming from, you know, where they're seeing over and over again that the government is clearly on the side of these business interests. And so Stanford used his influence, used politics in order to gain advantage in the marketplace. Um, Californians, you know, you see here that there is California with the railroad monopoly that is taking over every aspect of the California economy. A monopolist, but at the same time, he founded Stanford University. Now, those of you who are getting into the Gilded Age, this is an example of philanthropy. Okay. So a lot of times these, uh, these guys, they make a lot of money and then, you know, people don't like them because they've made so much money, maybe through questionable means. Then they say, you know what, I'm going to give a bunch of it back. And all of a sudden the person is, uh, you know, is a hero. And so now some railroads were built like James J. Hill's Great Northern Railroad was built without, uh, you know, any subsidies from the government. And this is one of the most profitable and successful transcontinental railroads in the United States. Now he had to build a little more slowly, but notice how the track seems to be, you know, seems to be a lot straighter on this railroad. Now, of course you get into the mountains and it needs to, you know, it's going to need to move around a little bit, but you know, this railroad was built very, very efficiently without land grants. So when you see here, there is a subsidized railroad and there is a railroad that was built exclusively with pub with without uh, exclusively with private funds. And so James J. Hill was given the name the Empire Builder uh, at the time. And so built it through private investment. And also when all of the other railroads went bankrupt in the 1890s, the Great Northern Railroad was not among those that went bankrupt. So were subsidies necessary? Were subsidies proper? Subsidies were certainly helpful, um, but you know what? Uh, what did you get there? Now there's still stuff in the way. All right, so imagine this now: your car can stop for a for a herd of bison to go through the uh, to go across the street. A train really can't. Okay, so this this becomes a problem because there were millions of bison um, that were out there on the plane. And so as far as that goes, the railroad started hiring people to kill bison. Now, at first, that was for to feed the railroad workers, but it increasingly got to where this is something that, you know, it was just killing them for the sake of killing them uh, because they were getting in the way. Buffalo Bill Cody, the reason he's called Buffalo Bill is he initially uh, was somebody who was a... Uh, initially somebody who worked for the railroads and he was to kill bison and provide that meat to the workers. So prior to 1870, millions of buffalo, um, you know, buffalo, bison kind of interchangeable. There are some people that get really technical about it. I think technically they are bison, but at the same time, remember for purposes of AP US history, doesn't matter which term that you use really. Um, and so by 1900, they were nearly extinct. Now remember the Plains Indians, uh, when the buffalo are gone, then they can't live their lifestyle. And this is uh, this is becoming a problem. But for the federal government, it's the Indians that are the problem. They're the ones that are in the way. Um, they are standing in the way of this American progress. Um, so gold claims in the U.S. Now, here's another thing that we see these people that are finding gold and silver <coughs> and 
people want that gold and silver. They don't want the Indians to get it. Now, they also don't want the Mormons to get it. There's uh, there's an interesting episode of how the states got their shapes. Uh, it was a show that was on the History Channel a few years ago. And this, uh, you know, it shows why Utah is shaped the way it is. Initially, it was going to have part of Nevada, part of Colorado. It's like, no, uh, we're going to make that smaller to get some of these, uh, you know, these gold deposits out of there. And so the Indian Wars, okay, now this was, uh, William T. Sherman uh, used the term, you know, actually used this term, uh, the final solution to the Indian problem. Uh, and so, you know, with Sherman, uh, he wrote that hostilities between the races will continue till the Indians are all killed or taken to a country where they can be watched. Um, and so Custer's last stand, this is kind of the iconic like battle. Now, of course, when uh, when my dad's generation was growing up, like your grandparents generation, Custer was seen as a hero at the Battle of Little Bighorn. You know, he's bringing the Seventh Cavalry in there to fight uh, this massive band of Indians. But people see it a little differently today. But several generations celebrated Custer as an American hero. Um, here is a U.S. Army memorial to the 7th Cavalry that was erected in 1881, a memorial to the Indians uh, who were fighting there with Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, not erected until 2003. Uh, so that is a relatively recent memorial, and you could see very, a very modern look to it. And so Sherman predicted that the transcontinental railroads, that they undermine the Plains Indians' way of life in a way that the U.S. Army couldn't. Uh, he believed that the railroads were eventually going to wipe out the uh, the Indians. And by 1890, all tribes had been placed on reservations. Now, 1890, that is not only the year that <clears throat> we see that the, the frontier no longer exists, but also the year that the end, that marks the end of armed conflict between the United States Army and Western Indian tribes. So the Apache Wars, uh, Geronimo, uh, led the Apache, which were the last tribe to offer a sustained armed resistance to the United States uh, through the 1880s. Um, you ever have a chance in southern Arizona uh, to go to the Cochise stronghold? I would strongly recommend it. Like what would happen? Cochise, who was uh, Geronimo's uh, predecessor, uh, you know, they would uh, they would attack, uh, they would attack, they'd raid, and then they would go back into this stronghold where the Seventh Cavalry cavalry wouldn't dare uh, go in there. Now, Helen Hunt Jackson was kind of a uh, kind of a proto muckraker. She was muckraking before it was cool to do that. Uh, a century of dishonor was Helen Hunt Jackson's chronicle of abuses and depri deprivations on Native American reservations. And so 1890, the Wounded Knee Massacre, um, that marked the last conflict between the United States Army and Native Americans as far as an armed conflict. And, you know, some people refer to this as a genocide. And I, you know, I, I don't see any reason to uh, disagree with them. There was, uh, you know, there was a sustained effort here to wipe out uh, these populations. And so as far as that goes, Frederick Jackson Turner, in his uh, in his essay, wrote that never again will such gifts of free land offer themselves. Now, four centuries from the discovery of America, the frontier has gone, and with its going, has closed the first period of American history. So that is the conquest of the West. The mission has been accomplished through homesteads, railroads, and warfare. And so, manifest destiny by 1890 has been fully achieved, for better or for worse, and of course, with some things that we're a bit embarrassed about looking back on them. All right, so with that, let me go ahead. Oh my goodness. Was I, was I not sharing my slides that whole time? Um, or was I? Okay, so I have been, um, sorry about, yeah, it, it was I not uh, in the chat here? Was I was I not sharing those slides? Oh my lord! Okay, um, okay. So let me uh, let me go ahead and done answering that question. Okay, so um, why did they create the Chinese? Ex okay, so when it comes down to it, Jade, as far as the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, after the 
so y'all didn't see oh my lord okay um yeah sorry about that but at least uh you know at least you got uh, hopefully you got something out of that but yeah I, I thought that i was uh i thought that i was sharing my screen that whole time all right so the chinese exclusion act uh chinese immigrants were a great source of cheap labor once the once the transcontinental railroads were finished uh being uh being create being built that supply of cheap labor was no longer needed and so <coughs> It's kind of like at the turn of the century uh, with the new immigrants coming in. There were a lot of factories opening up and there were a lot of jobs that there were there was a lot of need for unskilled labor. By 1920, not so much. So they cut it off. And of course, there was also the, uh, you know, the fear about communism. Why is Tammany Hall significant? OK, Tammany Hall, that was a political machine. OK, so political machines, uh, political machines are basically like you, you know, immigrants come into the country. And you say, OK, we're going to help you like Polish, you know, Polish immigrants, Irish immigrants, uh, they, they come in and you find you know, somebody finds them that is from that country. They speak the language. They're like, hey, we're going to help you find a, find a place. And here's a, you know, a low paying job. But that's about all you're going to get. But we're going to get you a place. We're going to get you a job. We're going to get you into the community. But when it comes election time. We expect your vote. And so Boss Tweed was the, you know, was the longtime boss of this Tammany Hall political machine that controlled all of these, uh, all of these immigrant votes. And there was a lot of corruption in his government, a lot of political patronage. Of course, it was exposed by Thomas Nast of Harper's Weekly. He made a lot of cartoons about Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall. All right. And so as far as that, uh, did it create uh, any finance? Well, you know, Kate, uh, that's a great question. It's not I don't see that happening on the exam, really. Uh, now, inflation wasn't real. You know, by the 1890s, it was, you know, the gold standard was there. So you didn't really have inflation as a problem. Um, but as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, the economy was growing. OK, and that's the thing. Like while there may have been some graft and inefficiencies and all of that, the economy's growing at just such a there's never been i believe i was listening to a story and lecturing on this time uh that there's never been a, another time in united states history where there has been such rapid economic growth so when there's rapid economic growth like this you can afford to have some things happen that aren't uh, that aren't necessarily perfect and so as far as that goes ladies and gentlemen uh i'm going to go ahead yeah we're, it's 802 so we're going to uh go ahead and close it out uh and it is always a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. I will see y'all next week, same time.